All right, good afternoon and good Friday to you. How's everybody doing? All right, this is one of our favorite events of the whole, whole year. Um, I want to take a moment as well and welcome everybody that's watching online. Um, while we're in here today, we know that a lot of folks who uh, are at home either watching online or there's folks who are behind a, uh, a desk looking at their computer screen and some of them have coworkers around them having a little office party celebrating with us today. So we want to welcome, take a moment, welcome all of you. Oh, it's Good Friday. It's the day that we, we, we truly think about and remember what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And um, we celebrate that today. And you know, we, we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we put this cross back here uh, for last Sunday and for today. And uh, we're, we're going to take it down after this service today because tomorrow we're switching gears because Jesus is coming up out of the grave. Uh, we're going to celebrate that tomorrow. But I want you just to think about, if you could, um, this cross and, and the cross that Jesus died on. Because uh, for, for so many, many, many years, the Romans used this as a, as, a, as a symbol of fear, as a symbol of torture. But Jesus took it and redeemed it and made it a symbol of hope for us here today. As we think about that cross and what Jesus went through, we think about the physical suffering that he went through, just a painful, painful death. But more than that, we think about the spiritual suffering that he went through at 12 o'clock noon when darkness literally overtook the whole world and God turned his back on Jesus, not because he didn't love his son, but, but at that moment, God poured his wrath, that cup of wrath of our sin, every bit of it onto Jesus. And in God's holiness, he had to turn his back because he couldn't stand the sight of it. But Jesus did it for us. And as a result of that, this cross and what he did on this cross has redeemed us. It has reconciled us back to the Father. It has made us right in his sight. And today we stand forgiven, redeemed, reconciled, restored, and made right. And we're so grateful for that today. So this isn't a funeral service. This isn't a time for us to mourn. It's a time for us to thank the Lord, to worship him, and to celebrate in our hearts what he's done for us today. So thank you so much for being here today. Let's stand and praise and worship our Savior.
No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ In His death and
we praise the name of the Lord our God forevermore. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. As you walked in here today, you should have received some communion elements. You can go ahead and grab those right now. You know, today on this Good Friday, as Pastor Brian said, this is all about his death. And when we take communion, as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes. And so this is an opportunity for us to remember the death of Jesus and how his death brought us life through what he's done through his body and his blood. And so if you would, would you peel back that first layer? It can be a little tricky. And take out the the piece of bread here. The apostle Paul said, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that on the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus' body was broken so that you could be made whole in every way, spirit, body, and soul. Isaiah 50 says that he gave his back to those who struck him. You know, Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down. He gave his back and the stripes on his back for your healing. Isaiah 53 says that he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And it's by his stripes we are healed. And so today, we remember the broken body of Jesus that bought our healing. And so in just a moment, we're gonna eat this bread. And as you eat it, this bread is gonna be broken in your mouth. It's gonna be crushed as you chew upon it. His body was broken for you. And he was crushed for your iniquities and your sins. Let's take this together and thank him. back that next layer, revealing the cup. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus shed his own blood to bring us into a new and better covenant. Under the old covenant, Our sins could only be covered temporarily by the blood of bulls and goats. But when Jesus shed his blood, once for all, he took away our sins. The Bible says that under this new covenant, our sins and our lawless deeds, Jesus remembers and God remembers no more because Jesus shed his blood. So right now, as before you take it, you may have to, you know, maybe you need to confess some sin to the Lord. You can feel free to do that right now. But also confess that in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Because Christ died for your sins, you can be forgiven of every sin, past, present, and future. Let's drink this when you're ready. And just remember, as as you drink it, this juice is being poured out in your mouth and his blood was poured out for you. Scripture says we actually make a, a, a proclamation, a decoration. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We believe that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, 
that he ascended to the Father's right hand and he is coming for his church. But until that day, we cling to the old rugged cross until the day we one day exchange it someday for a crown. We boast in that wonderful cross, the cross that meant death for our Savior, meant life for us. You know, when Jesus was taking communion with his disciples, before he took the bread and took the cup, he gave thanks. If Jesus gave thanks, knowing what he was going to have to suffer on our behalf, knowing what he was going to have to endure, how much more should we give thanks to God who sent his only son to save us? Come on, can we just thank him right now? Can we praise him today? Can we stand together? Thank you, Lord. We boast in your wonderful cross today. We honor you. We acknowledge you. We give you all the praise. Thank you for what you've done, Lord. Though the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross, it bids me come and die and find that I may truly live Though the wonderful cross Oh, the wonderful cross Is all who gather here By grace from me And bless your name Oh, it's wonderful pray with me, God, we praise you that we get to declare that and we get to be in right standing with you because of what you accomplished on the cross, that you bought us with a price. And God, as we reflect on that today, God, I pray that we would be filled with gratitude and thankfulness that in the midst of a weighty day, that it is heavy to remember your death, but God, we are so thankful that we stand on this side of the cross and this side of the resurrection. And so we say thank you, Jesus, for the cross. God, may you prepare our hearts as we continue to reflect not only on that, but also your burial and what that looked like. Prepare our hearts as we open your word, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, I want to invite you to have a seat. Hey man, what a, I don't know if I can think of a better thing to be doing on a Friday than this right here. In our time together as we open up God's word, we, uh, we actually are going to be continuing our series through the gospel of Mark, which is actually, we're very close to that story, that gospel coming to an end. 
And even though today is Good Friday where we are remembering and celebrating the cross of Jesus, actually it was this past Sunday that Pastor Brian walked us through looking at the cross of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus and all that was accomplished and all that happened because of his death on the cross. But as we continue with the story, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we continue to the gospel of Mark, we're going to come to a passage, a part of the story in the life of Jesus that to me, at least, quite possibly might be the most devastating part of the entire story, at least for those who were living it and experiencing it at the time. So the passage we're going to look at actually deals with Jesus has, has taken his final breath and he has died on the cross. He was, he was crucified beginning at 9 a.m. He breathed his last at 3 p.m., We have now made it into the evening of Friday. It is about 6 p.m. We're literally going to see the burial of Jesus Christ. And so as we jump into Mark chapter 15, as we continue with the story, as I said, to me, this might be the most devastating part of the story for those who are living it and experiencing it at the time. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 42 to verse 47, the burial of of Jesus. And it says this beginning in verse 42, and when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, he was a religious leader, he was a Pharisee, Joseph of Arimathea, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, it says he took courage Or he, maybe you might even say, some translation, that he took a risk and he went to Pilate, who was the governor that Rome had put in place, and he asked for the body of Jesus. So Joseph, even though he was a part of the religious leaders, even though he was part of the Pharisees, other gospels tell us that he had come to a place in his life that he actually believed Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Messiah. And even though the entire religious council had basically ushered in this execution of Jesus, it it lets us in that Joseph did not concur with that verdict, that he was not on board with them crucifying and murdering Jesus and handing him over to Rome. He was resistant to that because he believed in Jesus. But Jesus has died on the cross, and it says that Joseph takes courage within himself. And let's be reminded, sometimes, maybe often, many times, the world we live in, it takes some courage to stand up and publicly proclaim, I believe in Jesus. And so in this moment, he takes courage and he takes a risk and he goes to Pilate and he asks for the body of Jesus. In verse 44, Pilate was surprised to hear that he, speaking of Jesus, should have already died. So he goes and asks for the body from Pilate and Pilate actually is kind of taken back and he's surprised. This is is just about 6 p.m. in the evening. They, be, they crucified him at 9 a.m., and he's already dead. And so Pilate was kind of surprised. One reason why he was surprised is, is history tells us that often someone who was crucified, many times they would stay alive for a few days afterwards. Many of them would be left hanging on the cross for two to three days. And often, sometimes they would have to come around and actually even break the legs of those hanging on the cross to basically bring about their death. I don't have time to get into it too much this morning, but when someone died of crucifixion, it wasn't the physical pain, it wasn't the nails, it was due to suffocation. That's the way the cross and hanging on the cross worked. It compressed their lungs and they couldn't get a breath in or out. And so when they would break their legs, they would hang down, they could not push up to get a breath and they would suffocate and die. But Jesus took his last breath on his own and on his own terms. But Pilate was surprised that he was already dead, and he kind of wanted proof of this. So he says this in verse 45, continuing actually in verse 44. And then he summoned the centurion, and he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. So he got confirmation, he is dead. And so he grants Joseph permission to take the body Verse 46, and Joseph, along with Nicodemus, which the gospel of John tells us that that Joseph wasn't the only Pharisee that believed. 
that Nicodemus was also a part of this process. And so Nicodemus had actually showed up to help retrieve the body and take it down. He had actually showed up with over 100 pounds of spices and ointments to prepare the body. But it says this, and Joseph had bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of rock and he rolled a stone against it in the entrance of the tomb. Now this might seem a little bit of a minor detail of what Joseph and Nicodemus had done where they take the body, they wrap it, they prepare it and they actually put it in a tomb. Other gospels let us know that this was actually Joseph's tomb. It belonged to him. And he gives it to Jesus in this moment to bury him. Now, no detail is on accident. And there is something about this situation right here that unfolds that even plays a part in us even knowing that Jesus rose from the dead, that there were actually eyewitnesses to it and people who went to an empty tomb on that Sunday. As many people, once they were crucified, they weren't put in a tomb. Those 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 enemies of Rome, those, those criminals, those people who had rebelled, basically they were taken off that cross of being crucified, and they literally were thrown into a giant wasteland of dead bodies, almost like a trash heap where they had just laid just a pile of dead bodies on one another. That usually is what they did with bodies they would take off the cross. And so the fact that we actually even know where Jesus was buried, where the tomb was, was because of this act right here of Joseph and Nicodemus. And then it even lets us know that in verse 47, that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Another minor detail that's so important. They, they witnessed it. They knew it. And so for those that are familiar with the story, we know that when Sunday comes and the, and the women go back to the tomb, it's because they knew where it was. They watched them bury him, prepare him, and put him in the tomb and put the stone in front of it. And now here we are. Jesus is dead. And he's been buried in the tomb. And this moment kind of ushers us into a time that we don't maybe talk about often, But I think it's a part of the story that so many of us are living in and are experiencing even right now in our lives. It ushers us into this this kind of moment that's between the cross and the tomb, between the crucifixion and the resurrection, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We now find ourselves in this kind of in-between moment, this, this middle, this waiting, this broken, messy, what's happening, what's going on, I don't understand kind of moment. And we don't often talk about the Friday evening and Saturday, what was happening, what was going on, even early into the Sunday morning before the resurrection. But yet we now find ourselves in this kind of in-between moment between the cross in the empty tomb. And what was happening? What was going on? Why was this moment maybe so devastating to those who were experiencing it and following Jesus at this time? This moment where he was taken off the cross, his body prepared, and he was put in a tomb. And it ushers us into this moment of this in-between, this messy middle, this waiting and not being sure what's going on. To happen. So I want to ask a few questions and try to answer them in our time together today. And that is one, the first question is this, while this was happening, this in-between moment, this between Friday and Sunday, what were the followers and disciples of Jesus doing? Now I think it's important for us to either be reminded or at least made aware that even as Pastor Brian preached this past Sunday and, and the whole thing was like, here's what happened on Friday and this horrible moment of the cross and crucifixion of Jesus, but yet we ended on this moment that even though it's Friday, this, this kind of celebration of like, but Sunday is coming, right? Like we now, because of history and eyewitnesses, we have hindsight of what happened, but his followers and disciples did not. And I just want to remind us or make us aware of this, that to them, this was devastating. To them, they didn't know that Sunday was coming. To them, this was the end of the story. To them, even though Jesus, even though Jesus, 
Three times it's recorded in the Gospel of Mark. It's also recorded in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. Well, even though on multiple times Jesus himself predicted and told them about his death and resurrection, he literally told them on many occasions throughout the Gospels, I'm going to die. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be crucified. But three days later, I'm going to rise again. He had told them this, but here was the reality. No one believed him. They didn't believe him. That first Easter morning, Sunday morning, when the women were going to the tomb, you know why they were going to the tomb and they were going to take these ointments and spices and continue to prepare the body? Because they believed and thought he was dead and still dead. And so they find himself in this moment. So what were they doing when they watched their rabbi, the Messiah, the Christ, die on this cross and put in a tomb, and now he's dead? Well, we see it in some of this story of Mark unfold. We see that they were burying him. They were preparing his body. They were also preparing for the Sabbath. That Saturday was the Sabbath where they couldn't do any work, so they were rushing to get this done now. This is why they went back on Sunday to kind of finish some of it. We also know that they were mourning. They were mourning. They were upset. Many of them probably dealing with their own doubt. They had given their lives to him, three and a half years with him, and now it's over. Like even possibly on the cross watching him being crucified, maybe there was still a a glimmer of hope that he he could come off of that cross. He could defeat his enemies, but then he died. And now he's buried. And they're maybe doubting. Maybe for some of them, they were filled with shame. His disciples had abandoned him and forsaken him, and now they are carrying that, that shame and that guilt Maybe they felt hopeless. We know that many of them were hiding in fear. They had locked themselves away, afraid of what Rome and what they just did to Jesus, they're going to do to us. Some of them, and we know this because of even after Jesus was resurrected and he made himself known to them, some of them were looking to go back to just their old lives. Why? Because this story is over. Jesus is dead. And I believe the lesson, or at least a lesson that we can learn from their reaction, is even though Jesus had told them what he was going to do and what was going to happen, they just didn't believe him. And so we see them filled with hopelessness and despair and fear and shame. This is why they were responding to him as he was dead, and this was the end. I think a lesson that at least I know I can learn, and I have to try to remember throughout my life, when I find myself in similar moments where I feel those things, is maybe it's the lesson of this. Maybe it's the lesson that me and you have to remember. Never, never put a period where God has placed a comma. Never. To them, this was the end. To them, the story was over. And God and Jesus say, no, 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 no. The story's not over. Matter of fact, it is just beginning. Like you put a period here, like this is the end. It's not the end. And this is where we can kind of say, no, no, no. God is saying, but Sunday is coming. And so, so many of us, the things that we are walking through, we think this is it. It's over. It's the end. And God's saying, I'm just getting started. I'm not finished. There's still so much more to come. But have you and me done that? Have we put a period where God has placed a comma and he's still writing the story and there's still more to come? Maybe this is a lesson that we could all learn from today as we look at what they were doing and how they were handling this moment, this in-between moment, this messy, broken middle between the two. Well, another question that we're going to try to maybe address and answer is, and this is where it gets a little interesting, is, okay, if that's what his followers and disciples were doing, what was Jesus doing? Now, this is where we're going to go on a little journey together, and it's it's going to be a little interesting, okay? So let's just just do it together and see what happens. Um, But when we try to answer this question, what was Jesus doing 
between the cross and the empty tomb, between the crucifixion and the resurrection, between this Friday evening, Saturday, and into early parts of Sunday morning, what was Jesus doing? And I just want to be honest, honest with you, answering this question is not easy. It's a little bit difficult because the scriptures in the Bible don't say much about it. The Bible gives a few details, but even as you interpret some of those details, there's people who have a lot of different views and opinions on it. And so just so you know, just so I felt like I was in a comfortable, at least somewhat confident place as we were going to talk about this, I even looked at our pastor and I said, could you please look at this and tell me your thoughts? Like, how do you feel about this? So we're going to journey together on this. But the scripture in the Bible does not spell out all the answers for us, but it does provide some potential clues. It provides some scriptures that, that seem to speak to what Jesus was doing during this in-between time. And I want to be clear about one thing, because there is one thing that we know absolutely for sure. This past Sunday, as Pastor Brown was walking through the crucifixion, we see in the Gospels that Jesus was crucified between two thieves. And there was some interaction and a conversation that he had with these two thieves. And as he responds back to one of them who had actually asked Jesus to remember him, who had kind of put his faith in Jesus, even in that moment, dying on the cross, Jesus responds to him in Luke chapter 23, verse 43. He says this, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. So we we at least know this from the words of Jesus himself, the mouth of Jesus, that today he was going to be in paradise. What does that mean? What does that look like? Now, I'm going to walk through some potential scriptures that speak to this, but one thing I don't have time to completely unpack, but the scripture does talk about it often, is that me and you are more, so much more than just our physical bodies. God, the scripture talks about that we also have a spirit, we have a soul. Sometimes those things seem interchangeable. Sometimes they seem very distinct from each other, but we are more than just our physical bodies. So I do want to point this out. What was Jesus doing during this in-between time? Well, his body was dead, and his body was in the tomb. But his spirit, that's a completely different story. And so we're going to kind of dive into the scriptures to maybe help paint a picture of what was happening, what Jesus was doing. So I'm going to just read kind of through these together, all right? The first one is Luke chapter 16. Jesus is telling the story. Some say, is it a parable? Was it a real story? But it comes from the words of Jesus himself, the red letters. And it kind of gives us some insight of what happens when you die. And so Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 26, picking up 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man, poor man named Lazarus. This was not the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. This guy was covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. This is also known as paradise. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may across from there to us. Now that's a lot. But Jesus speaks to what happens. We continue on with some other scriptures as well. Even in the Old Testament, David wrote these words, Psalm 16, verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. Jesus again in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be 
three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We even get into past the Gospels in Acts chapter 2, verse 31, says this, And he, Jesus, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Therefore it says, when he, speaking of Jesus, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And then verse 9, in saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Just a few more. <laughs> First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed, this is where it gets a little interesting, where he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. By canceling the record, this is what happened on the cross. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, talking about what Jesus accomplished on the cross when it comes to our sin, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphantly over them in him. Declaiming, proclaiming the victory that Jesus ushered in through the cross, through his death. And then Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I were dead. This is the Apostle John recording all of these different visions and experiences he was having. Just a, a, a month ago, Pastor Brian talked about the end times. This is kind of part of that. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. Am I not the first and the last, the living one? I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And then Jesus makes this statement. I have the keys of death and Hades. <laughs> now that's a lot. That's a lot that potentially speaks to what was happening in this in-between time between the cross and the empty tomb, the crucifixion and the resurrection. What was Jesus doing? Now, if we start to piece some of those scriptures together, it starts to maybe paint a picture to reveal to us what Jesus was doing. Now, I'm going to put up a very basic, simple picture or diagram. And I just want to kind of sum up what we just read throughout the scriptures in the word of God. So if we could summarize this, if we could kind of put it in a picture, what is it telling us? What is it showing us? All that we just read and even the words of Jesus, I would say this, that up to this time, up to Jesus' death, all people went to a place called Sheol, that is known as the realm of the dead when they died. No matter who you were, everyone went to this place, the place of the dead. But it would appear that this realm of the dead was divided, that there were two separate places and spaces in this place of the dead. One side was a place of comfort, the other a place of torment. Godly believers went to a place of comfort called Abraham's side, our bosom, our paradise. The ungodly went to a place of torment called Gehenna, or even when we read in Peter's account, he talks about these, these spirits in prison, the days of Noah. Some believe also that there is a, a, an aspect called Tartarus. It's a word that's used there in the Greek that speaks to maybe fallen angels and evil spirits and demons, not just those who died in their sin, the ungodly, the unrighteous, but this was how it was divided. And apparently you can communicate between the two, but there is a great gulf that is fixed between them, which cannot be crossed 
are breached. And then when Jesus died, his spirit descends to paradise after his physical death. And this is the part that kind of fires me up a little bit. We see this from Colossians chapter 2's account. But Jesus preached and declared victory to the evil spirits, the ungodly, and the fallen angels are demons. Like it's like a victory lap. It is like him letting them know that you thought you were going to win. You thought the cross and my death was the end, but it was not. And it's like he's proclaiming an absolute victory. It's a declaration that you lose, I win. I have all authority and power. This is what he's saying. Yes, absolutely. I have defeated, I have defeated sin. I'm defeating hell itself, and I'm about to defeat death. This is what he's proclaiming to the enemy, and he's making a public spectacle of them. And so he descends to proclaim this and preach this and declare this. But then, now remember, this is pre-resurrection, all right, before Jesus rises from the tomb on Sunday. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he took the spirits of the godly. (laughs) He took the captives Those who had died still in faith, Abraham, David, Adam and Eve, all these people of the Old Testament, when he rose from the dead, he took the spirits of the righteous and the godly with him to heaven. He declares victory to his enemies, and he takes those who had died before him in faith with him to heaven as he conquered death. So this is a possible snapshot when we ask the question, what was Jesus doing during this in-between time, between Friday and Sunday? And what's the point of all of that? Remember what his followers were doing? They thought it was over. They thought it was the end. They were dealing with fear and hopelessness. And they were stuck in this broken, messy middle in between, and they weren't quite sure what to do or what was going to happen. What was going to happen? They were, they were doubting and not believing everything he had said and promised. And maybe me and you feel that way. All these things that he's promised. But what's the lesson there? That, that even in this moment where it seemed like the story's over and they're hiding and dealing with all these different emotions, when it, when it looks like God, that it's over and God's not doing anything, What does this tell us? What does this remind us that Jesus was doing all of that in between all of this? It reminds us of this, that even in our waiting, God is still working and God is still moving. Even when we can't see it, even when we don't feel it, God is still doing more than we could ever wrap our minds around or comprehend. God is not done. And even though you might find yourself in this place of waiting in the unknown and not sure what's going to happen or is this even real, God is still moving. God is still working. Even if you can't see it, even if it doesn't look like it, even if you can't feel it, he's moving, he's working. But even all of this It's a little bit of reflection of what we experience right now in this life. Like this life is the in-between. This life that we're all going through and living through, it is the messy middle. That Jesus has died and he's rose again, he's gone back to heaven, which we'll be talking about and celebrating in in just the next week or two. And he's made all of these promises, right? He said what he's going to do, that one day I'm going to come back. I'm going to make all things new, all things right. That one day we will spend eternity with him in heaven. He'll wipe away every tear. No more sickness, none more dark, none of it. It's all defeated. But yet here we wait. And here maybe we wonder and question at times, is it real? God, I'm tired of waiting. God, we're in this in-between, and it's broken, and it's messy, and it's difficult, and I'm struggling through it. So here's another question. Why, God? Why are we waiting? Why are you waiting? Why is this in-between? Why don't you come back right now? Why don't you end it all and fix it all? Why are you waiting, God? God. 
And he tells us why he's waiting, why there's an in-between, why we're living in it. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 9 says this, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Like time is different to the Lord. He works in eternity. No beginning, no end. But this right here answers the question, God, why are you waiting? Why are we in this in-between, this messy middle, this life? It says this in verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. As some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Some of us are so desperate and are begging God and Jesus, please come back now. I can't take any more. This is too hard and too difficult. It's too broken. It's too messy. I don't want to wait anymore. God, why don't you do something? He's saying, the reason I'm waiting, the reason why you think I'm moving slow concerning my promises and my word is because I don't desire anyone to perish and I'm calling them to repentance. The reason there is an in-between is because God desires to save you and those in your life that you love. That's why God is waiting. That's why we're in the middle. That's why we're in the between because God is still wanting to save people and he is still moving and still working and maybe that's you personally he's waiting on or maybe that's someone in your life that doesn't know him, that hasn't put their trust in him. So God is so good and gracious. You know what he's doing? He's waiting, patiently waiting. And so we find ourselves in the in-between, waiting on God. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes just for a minute. And I don't know if you're in this room or maybe you're watching online and maybe you're the person who's never put your trust in Jesus. Whatever your story, whatever the reason, but maybe today as God waits patiently, maybe he's speaking to you and maybe right now can be your moment. Can be your time where you put your trust in Jesus. If that's you, I just want you to know there's no magic prayer. This is something very personal that that has to come from your heart. But maybe if that's where you are and that's what you need to do today and want to do today, maybe it could be like this, a prayer or just your heart to God that you would simply acknowledge that Jesus, I believe that you are God, the Son of God, God in the flesh. And Jesus, I, in the best way I can, put my trust in you. I believe in you and who you are. Take my trust for myself and I place it in you. And Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner and I confess that I need a savior and I confess that you died on the cross for my sins to give me this victory and this life that you're talking about. So help me to believe and trust in you. I receive your gift of salvation. Come into my life and change me forever and help me to follow you and to live for you for the rest of my life and all of eternity. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're the one he's waiting on. But maybe it's not you. Maybe you've done that. But maybe it's someone in your life. You know, for the almost past 20 days, as a church, we've been praying for the people in our life who need Jesus. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If that's you, it's, it, it, you put your trust in Christ, but there is someone in your life. It is, a, it is a family member. It is a friend. It's someone you work with. It's a neighbor. It's someone you just see while you're out in the community. I don't know. But you have someone in your life that needs Jesus, that doesn't know him. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. 
as that person, and maybe they already are, if, as that person comes to mind, as you see them, would you do something for me? Would you just begin to put your hand in the air? All heads are bowed. But when you start to picture them and see them, this person in your life who doesn't know Christ, who needs this, would you just, when you see them, picture them, think of them, would you just begin to put your hand in the air? Once you have them, once you see them, I'm looking all across the room. Who in your life, is there someone in your life that needs Jesus? Just a few more seconds. Once you have them, once you see them, once they're in your heart and mind, put your hand up. So many hands up across the room. As your hand is up, and us as a church, here's what I ask you in just a second. I'm going to say a, a brief prayer. And when I say amen, I'm going to ask you all to stand to your feet. And for you that have your hands up right now, whether it's at your seat where you are, or maybe you even come down to the front of these steps. I'm going to invite you during this time of worship and prayer to come before the Lord who's patiently waiting, who desires to save them, to come get on your face maybe or kneel or to begin to go to the Lord in prayer on their behalf. That you would ask God to save them, that you would ask God to move in their life, whether it's through you or even someone else, that he would, that he would help them see their need for him and that he loves them, that he died for them. So when you hear me say amen, and as we start to worship and pray, I invite you, I invite you to come to the Lord on their behalf. Father, we stand in this moment so grateful, so grateful for just what you accomplished on the cross for us to save us and change us, to give us a life and a new home in eternity with you. But God, help us to remember today that we find ourselves in this life that is difficult and messy and broken and we're waiting and we're struggling because there's people who don't know you. And so whether it's us personally or someone we love or know, may we come before the throne of heaven on their behalf and cry out for you to move in their life to change them and save them. In Jesus' name, I ask you to stand to your feet as we move to a time of worship and prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Can't go back to the beginning I can't control what tomorrow will bring but I know here in the middle Is the place where you promise to be Not enough Unless you come Will you meet me here again? All I want is all you are. Will you need me here again? So as I walk. Now through the valley Let your love rise above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadow In my weakness your glory appears Not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Not enough 
So good, so good. A few weeks ago, I threw Pastor Nate a curveball. I said, you were going to speak on this passage, but I need you to speak on this passage. My brother, you did a great job today. Thank you. That was strong. And, and, and I think you, you know that was not an easy passage to speak on. But we're in the book of Mark. And uh, it is Friday, although that was Saturday. But we know what's coming next, right? Sunday. It don't matter if it's Friday or Saturday, Sunday's coming, right? And you did a great job leading communion. Pastor Spencer over here. And you guys did a great job leading worship. Thank you. If you made a decision here for Christ today, um, would you do us a favor, take out the Get Connected card, fill it out, check the box that says today, I prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior. Would you take it and drop it off at the help center or put it, uh, there's not going to be buckets, so uh, just take it to the help center because we would love to just follow up with you. One of the things that we always want you to do here at Westridge, whether it's a good Friday or whatever day it is, uh, Sunday, is we want you to take your next step, whatever that looks like for you. And uh, so we have a class called First Steps that we'd love to take you through, which is all about salvation and baptism. We have another class called Next Steps, which is all about becoming part of Westridge and then getting on a journey to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So I just want to encourage you to take your next step because there's always a next step and we want you to be part of that. Tomorrow we start our Easter services, our Easter celebration. It all begins at four o'clock and then we have another one at six and then we have one on Sunday at nine, another one at 11, 1245 on Sunday as well. At 1245, um, and this is really cool, we started this several weeks ago. We are doing um, Spanish translation. And we have uh, interpreters and we have folks wearing headsets who are literally hearing my message in Spanish. And so if you know somebody that um, does not speak English or struggles with English, but would love to come to Western, our 1245 service is now equipped for them. So we're super excited about that. And all of our Spanish speaking interpreters are helping us out with that. So 
And uh, I'm just going to tell you this because we've been in a progression. We've been in a progression. And Nate, you did such a good job helping us with this progression because we talked about what Jesus just did. But after um, Sunday is, is over, the following week, we're moving into like a six, seven week series on heaven. And uh, I know you have a lot of questions about how we're going to spend eternity. Well, we're going to talk about that for about, about seven weeks or so. So I'm super excited about that. Hey, have a great day. We're so thankful that you were with us. All of you who are watching online, thanks for being with us. God bless you. Bring your people back tomorrow. We're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We love you, Westridge. Have a great day.